<laughs> yes, that's very true. Always when dealing with topics, especially topics that are lived identities that you often get all sorts of shit from, please remember that it is not a monolith. People are gonna have different terms. People are gonna have different ideas and they're allowed to disagree and so are you. And it does not mean that we are at an impasse. It means that we're moving together to get somewhere, okay? And that's liberation for all of us, each and every one of us. And liberation is not an abstract idea. It's just something that's real far off. So we all, we're gonna do some work today. Y'all ready to do some work? <laughs> so friends, welcome. We're gonna talk a lot about queer design. We're gonna talk about what it's like to be queer and all of its permutations. But first, I'm going to do something fantastic, which is I'm not going to introduce these lovely people to you. I know them each, but I want them to introduce themselves for this express reason. Each of us has something that not sums us up because we're all wonderful beings that cannot be summed up. But I would like you to each introduce yourselves, what you like doing and love best, and what was one of your most favorite moments in any of the last LARPs you played. So take a deep breath, think about it. I'm Susan Weiner. Um, I have no pronoun preference. Uh, and I love a lot of things about LARP from all sides, but I love playing LARP, but above all, I love writing and designing LARP. And my favorite moment is when the LARP meets the players and you get to see your characters embodied for the first time. Um, and, but in terms of LARP experiences, I'm kind of surrounded by people I you know saw at Jowl right now, and that's where my brain is. Um, and I'm not gonna pick an exact moment because the thing that really made Jowl a meaningful and really awesome experience for me was getting to play a character with my Oh, with a gender expression that matched my own that was written explicitly for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. Just to quickly interrupt, that happened to a lot of us at the American Run of Jaw, and it really made things very powerful. Oh, my name is Dan. It's okay, we'll come Next around. one, next one. <laughs> There's the next one. Um, hi, I'm Morgan Nuncio. Um, I'm a LARP writer, a player, organizer down in Austin, Texas. Uh, what I love about LARP is just just the connection between people and being able to express that in very sort of different forms and very different ways. Um, and my favorite, I guess, moment of game was um, I went to Epiphany, which we ran down in Austin, Texas. It was Maisie Ascension-esque uh, spiritual sort of game that we played. And it was more like a spiritual retreat for mages. And just be able to dive into being true to who yourself is and using that to play in realizing what's going on deep inside you. Because these characters were close to home, mind you. They weren't like someone else. They were, these characters were extremely similar to who you were as a person. So being able to play that and be able to be vulnerable in this like house of 20 something people, 30, 40, <laughs> it was in December. It was, it was, and just being there and being able to be vulnerable with who you are and everybody being vulnerable. It's just, I think that moment of vulnerability that's trust between everybody really makes a great game. I'm Sharon Biswas. I'm a game designer, writer, and artist. And um, I, so there are a couple of things I, I really enjoy about LARP. I'm going to name three of them. Uh, one, I really like being in situations I would probably never in my life be able to be in, um, like to simulate being in them with other people who are most likely cool people, um, or I'm going to assume they're cool people and I will not find that because I'm going to leave. Um, I really like being told I'm very attractive and I have played a lot of characters who are very attractive. <laughs> exactly. Um, just like that little one thinks I'm very attractive. 
Um, and uh, I, this is really nerdy, but I really like um, making up fake academia in LARPs. <laughs> Right? Um, so like, I guess we professor this here. I'm like, hey, 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 hey. Um, so uh, yeah, and then I um, so recently, um, so recently, um, uh, on the first night of the Greater Conference time, uh, I was in a Jeep form game, um, whose neither whose name nor author I remember, um, but it was about like uh, like a murder, and the character I was playing is this like very conservative straight dude about to have sex with his girlfriend for the first time. Uh, and it was very cool because I have never been that nervous when having sex with someone. And I have <laughs> never <laughs> had sex with a girl that way. So I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. I get to be a nervous straight person. <laughs> that was a new experience. I am Kit Bissonette, they them. I am a LARP player from the West Coast. Uh, I've played games in Oregon and Washington. I am also hoping to someday write LARPs myself. Um, uh, I like LARP because it is a way for us to explore parts of us that we have yet to discover. Uh, my favorite part of a recent LARP was at Absentia, which was a one-shot LARP uh, put on by Ostari Games. Uh, and uh, I played a trans man character who got misgendered by three people the whole weekend. And one of them, who was the only one that misgendered me multiple times, actually by the end of the weekend was a romantic interest. <laughs> and it was amazing to actually have that walkthrough process of them coming to terms with the fact that I was in fact a man and then falling in love with me in the process. Like, why would you, would you want to that is fantastic. Uh, my name is Janae Kemper. I'm going to be your moderator. Um, I really love going to LARPs and breaking them. <laughs> that sounds really bad, but the truth is, I love the ability to do what I like in a LARP, to explore your fiction deeply and lovingly, uh, and to really seek out those experiences that I was told was not for me. Um, as someone who considers themselves bisexual, and I have since I was a very small child, I have always known that, okay? I did not understand why people, uh, I, I literally didn't understand why people kept saying, when you marry a man one day, and I'm like, I can marry anybody I want, don't tell me what to do. Um, that, that idea, is I'm able to express that in LARP. So one of my favorite queer moments in a LARP actually came playing, well, playing straight woman, the straightest woman that could possibly be straight, okay? Um, in a Regency romance LARP called Fortune and Felicity, um, my character's only son, as a side note, this is a LARP about marrying off your children, okay? Um, my character's son was gay in the Regency era in England. So as a mother, not only did I have to come to terms with that, I also had to protect my child from the toxic masculinity of 1815, while also <laughs> making sure that they could pass in a society that would have surely killed them, literally, right? And so that was heavy for some Jane Austen stuff, y'all. But, <laughs> but that conversation lasted for like four or five hours into the wee morning, and it means a lot to me. Um, yes. So let's get down to business. Should Let we feed the Huns? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, I've been saying that all weekend and no one has taken me up on that. No one. I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love you so much. Okay, so I, I actually want to talk about what you would like to see, okay, as, as LARPers who LARP with queer identity. What would you like to see more in games as far as queer representation? Yes, I went straight there. Think about it. And then, if you are ready to answer, just give me a little ping and I'll put you in stack. Yeah, we don't think. It's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult thought. Like, 
what do you want to see for yourself? What do you want to see for your community? Like, if you could write a queer game, like a game that engages with your identity, right? What do you want to see? I would like to see more of our fantasy and sci-fi cultures not being written to be like our Western culture that we have, <laughs> in that our Western culture enforces a binary gender system mm -hmm. where there are so many other cultures, even in our own world, that do not do that. So why is it that in fantasy and sci-fi, mm -hmm. we still have Western culture? Well, uh, Octavia Butler future, y'all. Um, I want to see a future that's not just queer, but, you know, just intersectional. I don't, you know, they, they a lot of the sci-fi that you see is for the white future, but you don't see it for the white, uh, the, 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 you know, the people of color queer future. Yeah. And so I want to see more of that. I want to see, yeah. like, I want to see, like, you know, Afro-futures, I know we uh, yeah. talked about it a bit, but, like, I want to see some more, like, you know, all that with the, the queer dynamics of, like, you know, Maybe Mexican futurism, like, you know, maybe, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, like. <laughs> I don't see why we can't do that either. I want to see queer ah! history before Stonewall. Mm -hmm. I want to see representation of Ooh. queer people in historical games. Yes. I'd love to get a little Weimar cabaret going on, because let me tell you, that was fun. As a side note, people of color were all up in there as well, so that could be a very intersectional game. Um, I'm really interested in seeing non-traditional relationships, like poly relationships and stuff, being in, in, in the fictions more. Um, I also, I mean, this, you, we mentioned this already, but I really like it when characters are written to be non-American or, or whatever country you're in. Because like, I, I, I often request, like, hey, I would not like to play a white person mm -hmm. because it's very default and easy to play a white person because the, the majority of our um, media is about uh, white people, which is, you know, it's a thing and I'm not going to be like, uh, of but um, it's so it's easy to step into that role of, yeah, I'm going to play a white person because that is the default. Yes. Um, I mean, we, like, the mythical norm is a yeah, white person. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like, if, if normal is white and normal is straight and normal is male, your characters are accidentally often written as white straight men and you don't know, right? And if you don't fit that, it takes a lot of shoehorning to get into that game. Yeah, that is, oh yeah, that's really great. So let's keep going on the futurism track, okay? Um, because I, I really believe that our player experiences kind of shape us. And when we think about designing for games and designing and making games, I think, mm, I think you do not necessarily need to be a designer, right? You, there's no sort, there's no, I am a designer, now, right? Um, but some of you have designed games. Now, have any of you really delved deep into queerness in games you design? <laughs> okay, so my, my, it was funny, because it was actually my first LARP I really rode. <laughs> Seth knows. Um, we did a LARP game session in Austin um, after Living Games 2016 because we're like, let's do the copper rattlesnake. And then we spent a whole day just writing like our own LARP jams and like having these set things. Um, my game is about, it's called colormatch.com. Mm -hmm. It's trying to find the right uh, person in your spectrum. And so you play as uh, three colors. Everybody uses they pronouns. Uh -huh. um, you're just this color. It's a very like gender neutral name. So like lemon or grape or moss. Because it's yellow, 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 green, and purple are the colors. And then you get your identity or your attractions and your monochromatic, polychromatic, achromatic. <laughs> and then you get possible kinks that you have. Or so, so you get a pattern. So you're like a plane. So you're like, okay, I'm a plane, you know. Or you'd be like, you're plaid. You're like, oh, okay, you know, you know, that's sort of legal. I mean, it's legal now, but it's still a little weird. But like, it's sort of legal, but now it's a little weird. Okay. Yeah. And then so it's actually sort of like an awkward dating thing where you actually sit around and you have speed dating with people as these characters. And then two minutes for each person. And then like at the end, it, it's not a long game. It's a, it's a, it's a nano game. And then after that, you're, you're like, okay, cool. Who, who do you want to, who, which people do you want to go off with? And like, you know, go on a date with afterwards. And I, I think that's great just because like, it, it gives you an idea that like, you know, that's it's, so yeah. And that's amazing. Where can we find it? Uh, I have it on a, uh, Google Docs right now. I can okay. share it with people if they're interested, but. And, um, and we're going to publish it and write it up and script it. Yes, I mean, I guess I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I think that's really important because that game is, that game is important to someone. Yeah. Please do that. Okay. Uh, um, 
I'll, so I've written a lot of queer centering game um, games. Uh, Quilt bag is a game that is hopefully going to be in the Resistance book, um, and that's a game that takes place at a college queer support group over the course of a semester, so it's a four-hour game and you're playing <coughs> that out. <coughs> but I also have a lot, the games that I write that have um, a romance in them always, you know, Cast Party is about a group of people <coughs> who are in a community theater together, and there are not any cis, straight, monogamous people in that game. There are um, a whole bunch of different relationship styles and mm -hmm. sexualities and ace and um, gender queer <laughs> things going on. So if I think there's a reason to gen, a lot of my, our games don't have, are all player defined gender, but if we've got any reason to gender the characters, all of the relationships are going to be queer. That's mm -hmm. just how I think. See, this is, do you, would you like I'm to I'm on my bathroom, so I don't have to. I mean, no, you of course you can. I, I want to uh, hear all your voices all the time. So, um, so recently f I was, I was chatting with a game design friend of mine and he was making a, a thing for a company and I was like, he was like, yeah, and then the prince saves the princess and I'm like, dude, you should make the prince save the other prince. You're a gay man. And he's like, yeah, but like not, not all the work I have to make has to have queer stuff in it. I'm like, yes, it does, because who else is going to make the queer stuff otherwise, right? Like most of the stuff I read, I'm like, nah, the main character is going to be like hella gay and going to sleep with everyone. Um, so um, I was really proud of this. So my design partner, Max, who you will see today because he's running a game with me tonight. Um, so all of you will see him, apparently. But um, he and I made uh, our first ma big board game where both of us were lead designers um, is a game called Mad Science Foundation. And in it, you are playing mad scientists uh, fighting to get grant money. Um, <laughs> and the thing is that you are all playing mad scientists. And we know from research that we have done when we used to work at the same lab, that when you say the word scientist, the first thing that comes in your head is a, a white man wearing a lab coat with a long beard. Like this has been shown, like, as, even if you are like, oh, but you know, that is often the first thing that comes in your head. So we told our publisher, and this is really cool, because if you're an indie board game designer, you know, and, and you're not famous yet, um, you know that you don't really have a lot of say in what goes into the design once the publisher has it. But we went to Cryptozoic and we're like, okay, so we have this game that you want to buy from us. Um, we would really like you to take these art suggestions into consideration because we know that representation is very important. Mm -hmm. So we said, so they're like nine, or they're like I don't know, six scientist personas you can be, and we said we want one person, one scientist at least, to be a little girl with fairy wings because we want to show that little girls who are into fairy princesses can be scientists. We want one person to um, look very punky and have like a mohawk and colored hair. Um, not because we're saying queer people have that, but if you want to read queer coding into that, you can. And we want to be someone to be able to be like, oh yeah, there's a queer scientist, maybe. Uh, we want to have scientists or people of color. We want to have gender neutral people. And, and we were really fortunate in that the Cryptozoic was really uh, into that, they were like, oh, no one's ever said that to us before. We will tell our artists that. And they were really cool because A, they said yes. B, they showed us the art before they published it and asked if we were okay with it, which no one will do if you are an independent Shut designer. Again. If you are an independent designer going to a big publisher, they don't have to do any of that. They're like, yeah, well, we bought your game, here's your tiny cut, um, which wasn't that tiny, so that was nice. Um, and what made me very proud, and this is a very self-call moment, was I was at Gen Con in my lab coat, promoting the game, playing with people. People were like, wow, what a nice costume. Like, bitch, this is my actual lab coat. <laughs> uh, I used to be a bioengineer, yes. Um, the, the vice president of the company came and he's like, oh, by the way, uh, after I spoke to you guys, we decided that's gonna be our policy for all the games we make. Oh. And I'm like, oh my god, you're so cool. I would blush, but my skin is too brown. Wait a minute. Um, so you're telling me that you put yourself out on the line. Yeah, because he could have said, no, we don't have to do any of this. We don't like your game. Yeah. So I felt, oh, I'm so brave. But uh, you are. 
But this is what it takes. But this is what it takes to get us put as you know with as being brave. represented. Like, yeah, that, that's what it takes. It takes that bravery, and that is brave. Yeah, because that's your money. And I, I really want to give a shout out to to. So I don't I don't like this idea of like ally cookies, right? Like oh, you do something that's a basic oh, yeah. human thing, you get cookies. But my design partner Max, you know, identify as a straight white cis man married to a woman. But he was like, he was the one who was like, by the way, Shara, we need to talk to the publishers about the art depiction. Um, and I was like, he was, that was really cool. So. What company was this? Like, this was Cryptozoic. Oh, if you are a board game designer, publish with Cryptozoic Entertainment. They are very cool Crypto to work with. What? Cryptozoic. Well, see? They're, 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 they're huge, and they're very good. The girl has a giant turbine laser thing as well. Like, that's fantastic. <laughs> In, in talking about games and in talking about designs, I want to make sure that we can all talk to each other as people are talking and just being, you know, kind in our interruptions as well. But you can please talk to each other. Um, it's true, but just, you know, we're just chatting amongst friends. There's nothing happening like a camera. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, especially about queerness as played in games or as created within games. Because since we are talking about the act of LARPing within the game itself, um, here is a very interesting, I think it's interesting. It's a little, it's a little heavy though. What do you think about straight people, those who consider themselves straight, playing with sexuality and gender within LARP, playing as people who have queer identities? Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Be respectful, but do it. No, and I agree with that because, like, I think, like, if you're, you know, you're straight, but you're also unsure still how you feel. Like, for example, I'm a, I just call myself queer within the last two years. I was, you know, I've always been around the gay culture and gay communities and queer communities pretty much since I was a kid. But I myself never felt queer enough. I never felt myself be like that. And so once I went to New Matashola and I met tons of new queer people and like I've met like living gay people who bring a lot more queer people like Chris, for example. These are just like gay people. I actually was like, you know what, this this maybe day the street thing isn't for me. And like I'll you know I'll go off this queer path and see where it goes. And um so I'm I'm a, I'm one of the probably the youngest queer people in here, but like it's just like I, I just finally I'm still learning who I am and so if straight people want to still like learn who they are and like figure that out and see if you know, oh maybe it really isn't for me, but at least I tried and like you know it gave it you know at least I get this like mindset, mindset and perspective of what's going on and mm -hmm. I think that's that's fantastic and I think we all need that. Sure. Um, I so there's a, a there's a fair amount of research out there that talks about how the, the concept of experience taking um, and a lot about how. Um, embodying or being in the shoes of someone else is probably the best way to foster empathy with those groups. Um, and so that, I know that's sad, I know we said we wouldn't talk about academia, we didn't say that. No, no, you, you can talk about academia, just make it accessible. Uh, right, so, so there is a lot of research that shows this is a really good way to foster empathy. And so from that lens, it's, I think it's a very good thing for anyone who wants to, to play um, identities that are not there as long as you know you're not being like mean about it and of course we're going to assume good intentions mm -hmm. and I so I like assuming if you are playing an identity that is not yours I'm going to assume you are doing it not as a caricature um, and that if, if if some issue does occur we you know it's not because you're horrible it's because things happen and we will talk about it um, so I think I think it's I encourage it a lot. I know a lot of people are worried about that. I'm like I'm not worried about saying straight people. Mm. <laughs> uh, um. Susan, uh, one thing that I so I live in the intercon community, um, and one can you quickly yes. uh, can you quickly just uh, inform us about the intercon community? So so the intercon community is a Boston area uh, LARP con that's been going for a very long time, um, and it is mostly uh, games that have pre-written characters and are, you know, games that are cast ahead of time and you come in and play this character. There are exceptions, but that's most of what runs at Intercom. And 
there is something I have watched happen over the past decade in the intercon community that I am absolutely ecstatic about, which is we don't, at this point, we know, we used to ask, how do you feel about, in, your, in our casting questionnaire, how do you feel about playing in a same-sex relationship? We don't anymore. We just ask, do you want a romance plot? And it's not culturally okay at this point to say, well, I'll play a heterosexual romance, but don't you dare put me in a same-sex romance, because that's just weird. That's not a thing that you're, you know, that, that, that we have, we culturally accept anymore. And I think this is amazing because, you know, this, that we've sort, and some of that is the um, cultural zeitgeist mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. But some of that is just that it's become more and more common and people have had more and more of those experiences in our community and they've moved past it. Uh, more yeah. than so I wanted to go back to what, you know, that, that's great. Uh, and I love that you did that. I, I just wanted, uh, there's something that you said about um, the characters of uh, playing, if there's characters in your game, that's a downfall of the game designers themselves for not being able to establish from the get go yeah. that this, you know, this is like, you know, don't don't do that shit. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not such a character. Mark. What do you mean? <laughs> no, I don't know the rules of engagement here. Sorry. It's all language. Oh, yeah. Fuck it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so if they if that characters are being portrayed in the game itself, then that's a downfall, and um, that organizer who is allowing this to happen either is allowing it to happen. So a which I hope this is the case, where people can understand, recognize, and see these characters and be like, ooh, these tropes are bad, let's not do that, and this yeah. is the reason why. Or B, they're ignorant and they don't understand and they're like not understanding the mm -hmm. true perspective. And mm -hmm. like, they're like, oh, well, our bad. You're like, no, you gotta keep vigilant on that and you gotta keep your, your characters and your players accountable of like what's going on. Yeah. Keep yourself accountable for writing this game in the first place. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. yeah I also think it's, it's I mean, it, it can be like frightening to play, and I, I, I know this, right? It is definitely frightening to embody a character who I expresses oppressed identities while belonging to a powerful identity yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you can feel that, am I showing this in a bad way? Like, I'm, I get nervous when, if someone asks me to play a trans character, right? Because I do not identify as trans, and I know that trans people are like murdered in this country a lot. And I don't want to, um, like make fun of that even inadvertently and that's that's a natural reaction um, which I which is not a bad reaction you want to be sensitive to things but I also think um, it's very it's fine to play a character which has identity and just not focus everything about that character about that identity right mm -hmm. so if you're playing a person who is queer and you don't have experiences of being queer, you can just play a character who's like, great, my character is a wizard professor who is also married to a dude. I don't have to now do tons of research about the history of LGBT oppression in wizard schools. Um, and then embody that and bring that in the hall, unless you want to. Is that a paper? Um, <laughs> let's make it a paper. Let's make it a paper, Jaya. Um, we talk about Dumbledore. Um, so, I, right? so if, for example, I have never, so I was in JAL where there were a lot of people who are identified as cis people who were playing, not a lot, there were a couple of people who identified as cis people who were playing trans characters, right? Uh, and I was not one of those people, right? Um, but if I were asked to play a trans man, for example, my first reaction would be, oh my god, that's scary because I'm not a trans man, I don't want to be mean, but my next reaction would probably be, great, I'm going to play a trans man. I know how it's like to be a man. I'm just going to be a trans man who is like me, like a man. Or like who expresses my version of masculinity. Um, and I think, I, I personally think that's an okay thing to do. Um, to, because, for example, yesterday I was at a talk which was about like, uh, bringing your own experiences. It was a very, it was a very philosophical talk, but like, and you, all you have is your own experiences. Yes. So, okay. I just wanted uh, to add back on to my, please play queer characters, even if you're not queer. I have had the personal experience of walking multiple of my friends that 
identify this cishet through the process of building queer characters. And in the process of building that character, they have discovered they are not actually cis. <laughs> Doing their research and talking to friends, they go, oh shit, that's actually me. Yeah. <clears throat> this was an amazing experience just building this character and it has changed my life. Uh -huh. So please play queer characters. You might discover something about yourself. That was a really interesting thing about the American run at Jaw. I wish that we had had some statistics or something going in and out of it. Because <laughs> let me tell you, there are a lot of people, like this is not, I'm just gonna say this, this is not a game that is like, now everyone who's played it is gay. Um, but what ended up happening at American Jaw, folks were just like sitting there, like silently for a while, and then looking up after the game and going, I'm gay though. <laughs> <laughs> like that happened. Gender expression, I thought I was. I'm not the this I thought I was. Oh my goodness, but that I think is a power. That's the power of LARP, really, because when you're exploring other people, you can find someone. And at the side note, you can play someone who is queer, and then at the end, and go, Wow, I guess I am really straight. <laughs> like, that happens too. Um, uh, please go ahead. I do want to say it is important, I think, there to, to mention that. Okay, so someone gave this uh, term to me once. They were talking about, I was a gel player, and they were talking to me about, um, of course the point of the game is not to make, is not, the Tor TK does not tout that now you will leave this game and you will have the same experience as yes. those who had AIDS had, yes. right? That is impossible. That's super important. That is impossible, yeah. right? The aim of the, the game does not say this is the quintessential queer slash cancer slash AIDS slash trans whatever experience. So it's not only that yes. you're, you're going into this game and, and, and you're, you're embodying the, the world of the 80s AIDS crisis because you are not really embodying the 80s crisis. You're embodying this idea that we are, it's a space to discuss and explore the world of the 80s crisis, not be in that world. Because that I think it's important to make the distinction be respectful of people who actually went through these struggles. Yes. We are ultimately only pretending to go through those struggles and that is a big difference, right? Yeah. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So part of those transformative experiences that Janaya mentioned is, of course, because of this empathy that is created, but also, and this is super important, the JAL run in America was actually a majority queer game. That's Most true. of the organizers and the players and definitely the writers of the game identify as queer. And so if you are someone who did not, the fact that you are around a lot of queer people who are being queer and wearing leather and looking really good in it. Um, <laughs> that was a call to myself. None of us do. That aspect itself, it's not just we are all straight people pretending to be gay and oh now we're all gay, um, which is unlikely to happen, mm -mm. but it is all we are non-queer people, A, empathizing and trying to symp sympathizing and trying to empathize, and B, in contact with a lot of diverse queer people that makes us question our whatever. Uh, there was a, a quote from last uh, pre-conference that popped up on my newsfeed today of LARP gives you glimpses, not experiences. Mm -hmm. That is gorgeous. And I felt like that was very pertaining to what you were saying. That is really yeah. I'm a very person. I like the I like the short snippet that's gonna stick with you. Well it works. Um I want to talk a little bit about something um that's been made about especially when considering uh, from a player perspective. Um a lot of us go to LARPs and many LARPs have a theme of romance. Um and we're gonna come right back to would you like to play a romance? Um something I've seen and experienced a lot is lack of queer romance and lack of people who would like to play queer romances in LARP. Um, so I would like us to talk about romance, queerness, and identity. What does it, what does it feel like? Like what kind of romances would you like? What kind of things do you envision when you think about, yeah, right, yay, that is a fun thing. When you envision queer love, what is, what is like to be in your body and being able to express love. 
mean, that was a lot when you were sad. I, I'm not quite sure I parsed what it, that, that question fully. Okay. So, <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, thank you for telling me that. Mm -hmm. um, I would like us to have a conversation about romance and LARPs in our <laughs> queer bodies. So, what is it that you don't get from romance plots that you would like to see? Um, what kind of LARPs do you feel kind of exemplarize romance and queer identity? And what would you like to make? Or what have you experienced? Oops. No, I'll go. Um, I actually uh, I brought this up in the romance panel because I was on that as well. Um, so I'm like, oh, hey, this is both things. Um, I'm actually, uh, I just started Minds of Society, which is a vampire, World of Darkness game uh, organization which is weird for me to get back into vampire, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and um, I actually play a queer Hispanic woman that was just brought into the vampire world, and mm -hmm. she is a part with, uh, she's under the wing of this, this, this guy who is a queer male, yes. who, who's on the, the, who's on the, the mainly pansexual side, but uh -huh. more like attracted to mask people mm -hmm. than you know, feminine, yet they have a great romance going on. On top of that, so it's fantastic. And the person who plays him is actually plays that character is actually a non-binary person as well. So, so that is I what I think is fantastic. So, uh, someone who's playing a non-binary person who's playing a male character uh, having a great romance with this queer woman, <laughs> like in game. Which I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm living for this, and I'm just always check on with them, like. Hey, you still okay with this? Uh -huh. You good? Okay, all right, we're good. And so I like that. I like the, um, especially with the open-ended campaign games. Uh -huh. um, not, you know, not having like a set like this is a heterosexual like society, blah blah blah. No, just keep it open. If you're gonna do like the uh -huh. campaign games that are gonna be like that, just keep it open and don't don't like try to put things in in, in binary roles or anything of that bullshit. So uh -huh. like, that's great. Yeah, sure. So I am a firm, firm denier of the deficit model of um, love and romance, Ooh. which is that you have a finite amount of love to give and you give it to one person and then they are yours forever and death do us apart, right? Um, and then no one else. So, uh, but you know, I, I recognize there are a lot of cultural norms, taboos, uh, contracts and stuff that uh, reinforce these ideas. Um, and so I really like that LARP <laughs> Um, and LARP, more than any other embodied styles of play, um, allow for the exploration of alternative um, relationship styles and, and romantic styles um, that you might not want to bring into your non-LARP life, into your non-fictional life. Um, so like, I find it really cool when people who um, are not romantically tied with, with other players okay. form romances and then are fine with that and then don't, not, don't necessarily continue that in the real world romance, right? I find it really interesting when people want to explore that because I think it is an outlet to explore different kinds of feelings yeah. with other people. Uh, I also find it very interesting, so I was asked by uh, a person who was coming to a LARP with me and he does not tend to identify as being into dudes. And he was like, oh, it'd be super fun to be in a romance plot with you. And my first reaction was, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, my second reaction was, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Also, you're cute, so why not? Um, uh, so I, I really like this, this LARP gives an outlet to explore romantic slash sexual um, things with other players in a, in a space that doesn't have to go as real. Well, sometimes it does. Uh, everyone knows about LARP structures and all that. Uh, well, not everyone knows about it. There's a thing called LARP crushes, sorry. should you see them? And I like that LARP provides that space. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I mean, I have had so many wonderful queer romance experiences in LARP. Um, most of my most memorable LARP romance plots have been queer, mm -hmm. and some of that is just the, like, hey, this is cool and I get to do this and it stands out, but like, you know, I, I have totally done the thing that you're, that everybody knows is not really supposed to happen, but everybody knows does, where I started dating somebody from a queer romance plot, you know, you know these, and so I've had such wonderful and intense queer romance plot 
experiences in games that mostly I'm going like, yeah, this is awesome and there's so much of it and it's so great. Um, and I hear that that may not be where everybody is coming from. So that's sort of where I am. Uh, so I primarily play games where you actually make your own characters. That's which great! Which doesn't seem common around here for some reason. <laughs> and I, I keep forgetting that that's not something that everyone does. Um, it's okay, uh, I the same thing. So I tend to not be a huge fan <coughs> of forced romance plots. Uh, like, last night I was thrown into one without any warning. Not a big fan. Luckily, it was somebody I liked, so <laughs> it was okay. Uh, most romances that I have ended up in have been straight romances, even when I am playing trans characters. <laughs> uh, so I, I can't say I have experienced a lot of queer romances in in the aspect of uh, gender playing into queerness. But when I played a uh, trans het character. That character was inherently polyamorous without me even actually making that a conscious decision. And watching other players also just like go with it was That's pretty really amazing. Uh, as that character, there was another person there that played my brother. And at some point we realized we were courting the same person and neither of us Ooh. found a problem with that. And she did not find a problem with that. And it was amazing. <laughs> that is, I think that's something very interesting that happens in campaign games. Um, because I've seen so many interesting queer relationships happen. And like it's usually like, once the pressure is off, folks are like, well, I mean, I guess I could try being non-monogamous in my pretend life. Um, which is interesting um, and neat. And folks try it out. I like the idea of people trying Okay, so I wanted, oh, yeah, of course. I also want to give a few words. I'm going to talk about sex now. So, um, I think games that have ways for you to express sex in game, not just, oh, we just had sex. Uh, I think those are important. For suits. To ex those are important to have. And that doesn't mean I want everyone in the game to be having in-game sex, mm -hmm. so why not? Um, but you don't have to, of course. Um, but I think it's important that those exist because I think as society, especially in the country we are in, we often take great pains to divorce romance and sex, which, yeah. yes, are different things, but are also very related. And so, like, for example, people... Uh, this is a side note. A gay friend of mine at Dartmouth once came up to me and said, Oh, my God. I couldn't, I couldn't be poly because for me, my relationship isn't just about sex. And I'm like, well, that is why I am poly. <laughs> right? Uh, and he couldn't uh, understand that. Um, and so, so I think it is very important to depict sexuality, not just, oh, I want to stare into your eyes forever, but yes, I want to take this pink phallus and do unspeakable things to it with you, right? <laughs> um. That is, as a side note, uh, one of the sex mechanics at Just Little Loving. And, and I think, and they don't have, so Just Little Loving has a very explicit, very, um, this is true. Uh, a sex thing that looks like you're having sex, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When I was at uh, Beat Generation, the sex mechanic is uh, you hold someone's hand and like wiggle fingers and things, right? Um, and so that is a very not explicit, but it still is there. So you can do that without having to mime fellating a pink phallus, right? Um, and I think it is very important that both those things exist, that in game you are allowed to express in an embodied fashion that you are engaging in sexual activity. Now, of course, you have to think about how you're doing it because in that game, it turned out that when people are holding hands, sometimes in game they, they were having like, sex, oh, yeah, ooh, but okay. no one else knew that. And so Alan Ginsberg, me, walks into a room and starts chatting with three people who are holding hands because I think they're just holding hands <laughs> when actually in the fiction they're having sex. Oh, we, need some, um, we need maybe some more clear techniques. Which is perhaps what Alan Ginsberg <laughs> would have done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I only found that out in the post game workshop. Like, oh, you're having sex. I oh. thought you were. 
hand holding. Um, there's actually a LARP type of based off Monster Hearts that's still in beta right now. So as if you know Monster Hearts probably a popular tabletop game mm -hmm. which focuses on queer identity and sex. Teenagers, and sex. Uh, so and there's actually mechanics in place that like for example, characters can't stay, stand more than three feet from each other. Mm -hmm. They can't look each other in the eye unless they start a spark where they exchange greetings. I don't know if y'all play Power by the Apocalypse games, but they exchange dreams that way they just make eye contact. And so if you're close to someone, you're getting cozy. If your shoulders are next to each other, you are kissing. If you're holding hands, you're having sex. If you have a glove on, oh. you're having protected sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that no they glove, added no that glove. in. Yeah. So it really keeps, it adds into yeah. the teenage awkwardness as well as like, you know, being like people comfortable with uh, basic touch that's as well. A, that's a super so, interesting. So it, it's it's still in play tennis. Uh, John... Sorapoulos? Yes. John Sorapoulos. <laughs> I can never pronounce his last name. <laughs> <laughs> Made it, and I think it's there uh, now that 2.0s came out. I think he's going to start reworking it, so That's cool. hopefully we can start poking him about it. I am now going to give us lots of time for questions. So before we start, everyone take a deep breath in. Let it go through your mouth. One more time, deep breath in. Let it go. So let's. When you state your question, let's be loud and clear and be proud about what you're going to say, even if you're a little nervous, okay? Yeah. There's, there's a question from a, from a human that had to leave the room. Okay. <laughs> so you can start there. Uh, so going off of what Morgan said about wishing for more intersectional design, uh, how could we change the execution of queer design thoughts and philosophies to be intersectional, intersectional without being poverty or marginalization tourism? Ooh, what'd you say? Oh, jeez. Who asked that question? Uh, that would be uh, Gabriel. <laughs> in case you don't know, Gabriel is a brilliant mind and wonderful to have in our community, and I'm very happy. Please. What do you think? Oh, geez. <laughs> so, okay, so first of all, of course, it's a very complicated question, right? <laughs> Second of all, I, I'm thinking about it a little bit, and I, I feel one of the things that, one of the things that differentiates this from, like, poverty tourism is we're not actually gaping at people who are, you know, poor or gaping at people who are whatever, 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 right? And so, that's, to me, that is actually a big distinction, where when you are doing something where, oh, I'm going to take spring break to go to this place and like build a school for people who actually don't need that, they need something else. Um, but I'm doing it because I want to feel good and I can, I can say that I have lived the life of the, the poor person, right? Um, that involves real people who are going to be affected. And so one of the things that LARP does is that it does not involve the those real people, mm -hmm. and that it is a fictional space in which to explore. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you can go and be a jerk about it, but I would like to get assuming best intentions, that the intention is there, and that we can talk about this later and not really affect the actual people. That is one of the thought, that's one of the first things that comes into my head from that question. Do you think it like opens, it, it, let, it, it intrinsically opens conversations? Yes, I, I, that's my first thought, though it is very complex. Okay. Um, Morgan, open, uh, make more freeform games. Don't charge a hundred, three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars for your games. Um, it's games themselves can easily be, you know, you rent this black box for a week and everybody those five dollars in to support the black box mm -hmm. and maybe the game designers themselves to need to just a little tiny little bit. And uh, you you host these games for people who are welcome and wanting to come and join without having that um, financial barrier to, to hit. And they're able to play yeah. these games that like, <laughs> yeah, we, we leave it out a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it gives us more games, to be honest. Oh my god, yes. It gives us a library of games that we can share with each other. Monica, to talk <laughs> that we can share with each other. <laughs> I am going to the summit. Put an ex one of the most powerful LARPing experiences I've had on the table. And I want to hear what some of the other people on this panel have to say about it. Okay. Um, I played in a game called After Party, uh -huh. where I played a black trans man. I did a bunch of research, and it was one of the most challenging 
role playing experiences I've had. Uh, one of the mo in most interesting sort of plays with intersectionality and race and gender. And it was really powerful for me. At the same time, it was me playing a black trans man. And there's been a lot of discussion in a lot of communities over whether that's a, a good thing or not. Ooh, that, that is a deep and thorny issue. <coughs> a deep and thorny question. Who designed the game? Uh, Kate Fractal. I think there might have been other writers, but that was the main. No, it's just Kate. Was, just it, Kate. was it a okay. free form, form intercon? It was an intercon pre okay. pre-written character style. I think that, I feel that that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about do you want to play a queer character or not? And like this idea of um, like, again, that you, as long, you, you're recognizing that you are not a queer, a, a trans black man, or you recognize you're not whatever identity, so that the things you do, you can't just come out and say, oh, now I know the, the experience of being a queer trans black man, because I played one for three hours in Boston. The fact uh, that it's like an English BBC accent is the best. Right? Wow. Um, it's like, like uh, the ability of women going to Africa and like working for weeks. Right. So, so that's right. So if you yeah. come back from that, I think it, I think it's it's wonderful that you went to a, a specific country, not a continent, um, and did something. But coming back and saying now I know what it's like to be an African, um, that's not true. Um, so I think. What uh, the, the important thing there is it's important to recognize I played this marginalized identity um, and that gave me some insights and glimpses. Um, but and I, I think that's, that's perfectly acceptable, uh, especially if you know someone gave you that character. Um, but even if not, that's not a problem. Um, as long as you recognize that, okay, that was interesting and, and cool and I, I gained whatever learnings, experiences from it. Uh, but that I, I do not have the right to, to go to my trans black friend and say, I you know what it's like to be you. We're brothers now. No, really? um, because maybe, maybe they're very close and they'll just look at you funny or maybe they will get really offended because that is not the case. And again, if you are a black trans man, you have a high probability of being murdered in this country, uh, which was not the case when you were in that lot. You had a very low probability of being murdered this while in the lot. Um, so. uh, I don't feel like it is my place to touch on, on what Susan has brought up here. Okay. Um, so for me, it always gets dicey, because like the question, this is, I say yes, but I also say maybe, but I also say no. And <laughs> it all depends on the following. How many people are in this game? Who made it? Why did they make it? Why is this character this character? Is it integral to the character that these are the identities that they're carrying? Why are they carrying those identities? What, how is this supposed to be quote unquote embodied and performed, right? Like, what are the markers that people are using? Because if in your brain, a black man is something terrifying, right? Or if something awful or something wrong, or like you have some, we all have ideas. We have been socially conditioned to believe in what uh, a black man looks like, okay? And you don't know, there are black men out here walking around with blue eyes and blonde hair, okay? And, or there are folks out here walking who are not what you think of. And so sometimes we rely on those stereotypes or those abilities without understanding the full complexity of people. And your LARP characters are should be as complex on the inside as people are. And that is so difficult. In my opinion, that's one of the most difficult things. So I can't sit here and be like, ooh, we need to talk afterwards after the camera is off. Like, I'm not gonna do that, right? That, it sounds like it, it totally, really informed you and it, you had a time, right? You had an experience, but you're also not out here taking that experience and saying, well, now that I know what it's like to be a black trans man, I would like to inform you all what it's like. And I think that I think that's important, but I also think it's important to talk about who designed it and why. Because Just Little Loving has Puerto Rican characters in it, and there are very often people who are not Puerto Rican playing those characters. And that informs people, like, that 
that happens a lot. Being able to play an intersectional black woman in that LARP meant that I played on race. And people had a hard time. Because as folks start dying in the 1980s, the queer community gets super fragmented. And it goes along the lines of race. And white people take pick, picket fences and money home to Westchester, and everybody else was stuck in clubs learning how to vote, which, by the way, was very beneficial. Um, it's a thing. Well, I, I also think that, there, and I say two things about that. Uh, first, I think it's very important. Like, I, was, I asked and I was given a character in Justice Loving who was South Asian, but I did not want that to be my main plot line. So Morgan, very consciously, was, all, was a lot about race. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Sharon's character Chain very consciously was not because I Sharon went into the LARP wanting other things and that is acceptable to yes. be a character of a certain yes. race and not be like now I must grapple with this thing right exactly. but the other thing which I think is very important which is what you uh, brought up about this idea of, of looking at, at the complexities around identity and why the thing was made uh, one of the things that made Just the Loving very powerful is that every day in the morning we had like five hours where we're like, and now we will listen to lectures about this topic oh, and yes. we will read about the, well, listen to a reading, but same thing, um, about this topic. We will discuss what this issue means. It wasn't just like, hey, do you know what would be really fun? Being hella gay because like fashion and Broadway. Exactly. Which someone <laughs> once came to me and said, what kind of gay are you if you don't know about fashion? I'm like, excuse me, A, I'm very fashionable. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and B, what are you talking about? Well, the playing um, on so. different, they were also playing on difference workshops, which it was like, let me tell you where you're not going to call people in this LARP, because someone will find you, and it will not be pleasant. That's not what they said, but I felt the love, and it felt very nice. But, but that, that felt like we were actually grappling with the issues at hand, in a very interesting, we were actually discussing and learning and reading and talking. We had people who have HIV come and talk to us. We had people who had lived through the AIDS AIDS crisis come and talk and to us. And yet, so. we still, if we are not in those bodies in real life, can claim the experience right. of those bodies, and we always have to investigate ourselves. Um, yeah, so I just felt like what you were saying pertains back to my answer to what Gabe's question was earlier. How do we make it so it's not tourism? Well, it depends. Who's writing it? What are they writing it for? Who's playing it? What are they playing it for? It's, I mean, I'm with you. Um, I had a question about that. Both, both, both those last two questions. Yes, please. Since it was pointed out that um, you guys, or, or you, everybody was saying that, um, sorry, I know we look super nervous. We're here what for gives you glimpses at rather than like lets you be or become, it's, it's about our perception of, mm -hmm. of, of what we're embodying rather mm -hmm. than necessarily becoming that embodiment. Mm -hmm. And I guess, so that means we're all bringing baggage in to the oh, pool yes. that we're playing. Yes, we are. How are some of the ways that you can help diffuse, or you feel like you can help diffuse that from being tourism or, or, or anything like that by unpacking that afterwards? Like, you, you mentioned specifically starting a conversation. What are some ways we can have that conversation or include in that conversation to help unpack that? Well, I really liked what Janaya said in the keynote today, which is, you know, A, have people of those identities involved in the design and the play of the game, uh, because that will definitely bring perspectives in that you want there to be. And I think, so some of the things, uh, like in, we had, in, in, I'm going to talk about just loving love because it's directly about queerness. Um, you have discussions, you act, there was reading that we listened to chapters from books, we had presenters come and talk about their lived experiences. I think those are the big ways. Uh, so, a lot of Nordic style likes do these lovely workshops before their events. Get you a workshop, y'all. They, they will not <laughs> let you play their game until they have vetted you, the player, into being in the player headspace they mm -hmm. want you to all be, to be the character. And that is pretty amazing. They also tend to do a lot of debriefs in which, if they are actually prepared for debriefs, they will have proper questions in order to bring you back through that space to mm -hmm. who you are and to bring that knowledge that you just got into yes. a better light. I feel like that is something that we 
have yet to transfer over when we do debriefs here mm -hmm. in the States. Mm -hmm. A lot of That's people true. don't do debriefs properly. They're all like, let's sit in a circle and talk about our experiences, oh. rather than, okay, here are these three questions that I need you to answer me to get you, the player, to understand what you, the character, just went through. Um, my academic work uh, actually delves into autoethnography uh, as a way, which is, autoethnography is essentially you looking at your life and thinking about the themes and the issues and what makes you a whole human being. What I do is I look at the player character that I've been, I write, you know how you write your LARP narratives afterwards, you're like, this is what happened to my character at game, right? Take that and then compare that character and what they went through to who you are as a person. Look at where they are in their community, how they live their lives, what they believe in, did you fight against the oppression that you were being used in the LARP? All those things are so useful to investigating self from the inside out because when we talk about LARP changing folks, I truly believe it has to come from the inside to go to the out. If we want to change things, we need to look at that really nasty inside that we've been socialized to believe. So for me, the answer to your question is, at the end of a LARP, sit down with yourself, talk to your co-players, but most importantly, sit down with yourself and really think about who you've been. Um, and just a little loving, just to talk about it again, um, <laughs> does letters to your character. You write letters right after the game, you're still in space, but you write these beautiful letters. And I apologized to my character because she was going to have a much harder life than I ever was going to have. And I had to put her through that so that I could remember that that's the shoulders I stood on. Um, next question. Yes? So uh, we talked a lot uh, on the panel about embodying different identities mm -hmm. and, um, and you talked about the workshop being really helpful. What have you found to be helpful if you actually get into a LARP and someone is embodying an identity in a way that's offensive or could be triggering to someone else? What have you found as techniques to kind of take that person and be like, you can't do that? <laughs> like, that's like, there's just the, yeah. Great, Morning. find an organizer. They're the ones who are supposed to be having these things in place in the first place if that happens. And if the organizer doesn't step up, then obviously that's a shitty game and you don't well, win. I guess I mean like as an organizer. Oh, as if you're the organizer before yeah, doing yeah. that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, that, sorry you, that was I thought that was you as another player. I was like, no, you find that <laughs> organizer. You tell them what's going on. You have something in the legit. <laughs> but as the organizer itself, um, I would definitely take them off to the side and be like, look, I... This, 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 and this is what's happening, and uh, you either change it or you leave. Because don't, don't, don't give in. Don't. You have to have a firm background on what you believe in and what this game is going for and what you want to stand for this game, mm -hmm. or everything's going to fall apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the point that a player is damaging other players out of game, they need to be spoken to, mm -hmm. and if they do not change their behavior, they need to be gone. The hardest thing to remember as an organizer, and oh boy am I guilty of failing this one, is sometimes you need to remove a player for the good of the game. Mm. Players are more important than the game. That, and when I say players, I don't mean that problematic player. <laughs> because sometimes you need to learn that you don't get invited back until you deal with yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to do it nicely because, gotta be honest, and I'm really, y'all know I'm about burning stuff down, but sometimes people don't know because that stuff comes, like we said, it's internalized. So you have to go, oh, by the way, you're wrong. I'm gonna tell you, this is the first warning, you're wrong. Second warning, you knew better, and now you're double wrong. Third time, deuces, goodbye. I I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm wanna stress that a little bit because um, I, again, I come back to the assume good intentions, right? And this is very different from if a player just like assaulted someone oh, versus yeah. if a player is, is portraying something in a way that some people find weird, right? Because there are a lot of people who, um, that is a root to the problem. If you grow up in a place where you have no contact <laughs> with anyone apart from people exactly like you, you will not know things and because of media portrayals, you will think things are a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I, I believe that people should be removed if they're problematic, but 
I also believe in assume good intentions. And so I like Janai's idea of like, speak to them first and be like, hey, people are saying this is the issue and I'm not going to assume that you're doing this maliciously. I'm not even going to say that. I'm just going to say, people say this is an issue. We would like you to not do this anymore. Um, and if it, they, they do it again, then you're like, hey, then, you know, we told you already. Mm-hmm. Again, this is not when it comes to cases like assault. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have resources ready to give them. There are, oh my goodness, there are a ridiculous amount of resources yeah. available yeah. to you on this thing called the internet. <laughs> <laughs> a ridiculous amount. Yeah. You, the creator, have those resources ready to be like, here is why this is problematic. Please read this and educate yourself so that you can fix you mm-hmm. and not be a problem to our game and our community. If you if you do not find the resources, then hire somebody to make them for you. Oh, I like that word, hire. Susan. Also, <laughs> you can head some, or well, not all of this necessarily, off by providing those resources ahead of time. <gasps> what? Um, like in quilt bag where we know people are going to be playing identities that probably don't match their own you give like here's a list of here's some terms that you could use to go find some good youtube videos to watch from people who have these identities here's some suggestions for research here's a dictionary of terms that were a glossary of terms that we're using in this lark um and that's not the end all be all because some of your players are not going to do the research Mm -hmm. Um, but making it easy for them and encouraging them to do it can help. Can I tell you a sneaky thing I do? I like I I do buffer campaigns, but I also write for Nordic Larks. Um, and you will get a character sheet, and it'll explain who you are and your background, whatever. I like to put in quotes and links and books at the beginning that inform a character. So I recently wrote a whole faction of revolutionary characters. And all of them got like intersectional quotes at the start of their thing. So you may not read it, right? You may look at it and think, oh, this is a nice quote. But somebody Googled Audre Lorde last week and they never had. So like stuff like that is like I sneakily put it in. I also, I also, because of what we were talking before, we were just telling you, oh, be brave and play identities that you don't normally play. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine it being really shitty if you were brave, played an identity you didn't play, Got it wrong, made someone, not got it wrong, but made someone feel uncomfortable, and then we're told by Oigna that you're a shitty person for doing that, right? That's probably really awful, because you took it, you're like, you know what, um, uh, Sharung and Nuncio just told me to go try playing this character, and I did, and then I got yelled at because I made a mistake, right? So, for that reason, uh, this, like, pre-educated thing is very important, but also, when you are telling people that they, uh, that they did something that was not the best, and that here are resources, I would be, uh, n- again, assume good in the language that you use. So I don't think it's helpful to tell someone this is how you will, how to fix you, yeah. or this is how you can stop being horrible. Um, it is nicer to be like, hey, um, thank you for whatever. Um, just so you know, some people have raised a concern. Um, in order to like address this concern, I would we we think this might be very helpful. This resource is helpful. Stop this behavior. Very helpful, and not you're the worst. We're gonna take one more one more question because we are running out of time. Yes. Um. So one thing that I think gets missed, especially when there's romantic plots, is like characters that um, are somewhere on the sexual spectrum. Uh huh. What have you encountered in terms of ways to like make sure that people that want to portray sexual characters don't get left out? Write them. <laughs> <laughs> so, being an ace person on this panel, I, I actually myself was starting to feel just uncomfortable listening to people talk about sex mechanics because that is not a game that I wish to play. I I, I don't mind playing it occasionally if I have warning to it. Uh, uh, are you more curious for ace players or ace characters? Both, actually. <laughs> I'm really happy that you brought that up. It's super important. Mm-hmm. Having a way for ace players to get out of situations is a necessity. I will not play games that say I have to have sex with somebody that is having sex with me. 
Oh, oh that should. Oh no, that should. I will not go to them oh, no. at all. Mm. <laughs> like <laughs> even if like even my play my my character, I will not go to a game that says my character has to go through this. No, I'm out. I think that's have mechanics for people to be able to step out of those situations, both the player and the character. I think it's also important to mention being a romantic. Like there are some people who just don't have those feelings, and I think that's entirely credible. We need to write those too. Mm -hmm. Like if queerness is a spectrum, then we need to respect the whole spectrum, not just like four parts of it. <laughs> yep. True facts. Anyone else? Okay, we're gonna wrap up, but as we wrap up. Um, keep in mind that this con is very important with talking back and forth. You can catch people, you can chat, it's informal. Everyone is an expert. You are all experts. We all have things to bring to the table. So please do not feel as if just because you saw someone on a panel, you can't have dinner with them or you can't chat with them. Please talk to please them. Please offer me dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please be my friend. Um, so like seriously, everyone is friendly. However, I would like just a quick parting word on what you would like to see the future of queer LARPing and queer gaming. Just quick, quick future. Ready? Take a deep breath. Let it out. I, for one, would like to see queerness being normalized in every single genre and type of life. That's it. Like, there's, there, there, there were gay people everywhere, there are queer people everywhere, and it's been throughout history, and we have documented it, so let's get on it. Um, I want to see more of the letters represented. <laughs> um, I want uh, LARPs in general just to be more queer, more brown, more proud, and just being who we are as a community being reflected uh, I'm gonna quote Eric Mersman when he tweeted once that that uh, queer subtext is not enough. Um, so and I retweeted it because it's so cool. Um, but uh, I really want there to be not just games where oh yeah you can be any gender any sexuality, but I want there to be more. Oh no, this is explicitly queer and this is explicitly poly because. You know, subtext and, and maybe maybes are not enough. Yeah. I'm gonna go even a step further and say I want to see more larks where the queer is the default. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. <laughs> that I am so thankful to know and have the pleasure of larping with some of you. I hope that we all lark together. I am really grateful that you have spent your time here with us, and I would like everyone to give a warm. Round of